So hey, this is day four in my quest, my never-ending quest to have 30 days consecutively of YouTube videos. Yesterday evening, I had a conversation with 2D teaching fellow, Lindsay Camillo. It's already set up, isn't it? Do I need to respond? I told her for a death metal band. Oh, right. I just made it over the summer. Is it, is it for real, like a death metal band? Yeah. It's like a real project? Yeah, it's a band in Nashville. About representation and about the underlying reality of both the artist, contemporary artist and designer's condition. And I referenced, in that conversation, I referenced a book that I read or that was written and that was written, both written and that I read in 1995, written by Walter Truett Anderson, uh, entitled Reality isn't what it used to be. I had just left graduate school and was working as a designer at uh, Electra Records, 75 Rockefeller Plaza in Manhattan, and I took the Rolling Library at home, AKA uh, Metro North, and had a tremendous amount of time on my hands to, to read. So I was reading a, a whole host of different things and just happened to pick up this kind of pop, pop sociological book, but in the book, I think that the book reminds us it's drawing, it was drawing from a lot of postmodern philosophy, but the, but the book I think is, is very approachable um, and yet reminds us of a number of critical, very critical components that the designer and artist should keep in mind. And I also think that the book prefigured, it really prefigured a lot of what we're seeing in the media, in the contemporary media landscape. So what I'm gonna do for this episode four is I'm going to read a few selected ex excerpts. It's, it's, they are, again, they're excerpts from from the book. And then I'm gonna to try to talk about very briefly and quickly, I'm gonna talk about what I think the ramifications are for the artist. And this is from Walter Truett Anderson's Reality Isn't What It Used To Be. We repeatedly create symbolic systems of meaning, religions, political ideologies, scientific theories, and then forget that they are our creations. We have a devilish habit of confusing them with the mysterious, non-human reality they were meant to explain. We have constructed about ourselves and within ourselves an environment of symbols and cannot tell where the symbol leaves off and non-human reality begins. Cannot, as the general semanticist put it, tell the map from the territory. On one side are the objectivists, who see the human mind as capable of more or less accurately, more or less impersonally, mirroring external non-human reality. On the other side, the constructivists hold that what we call the real world is an ever-changing social creation. Now here's where we get to the meat of what I was discussing with Lindsay and what I think the implications of many of these ideas are for the designer and the artist. We all become consumers of reality, although as in other forms of consumption, not with equal buying power. And greater numbers of us also become creators and merchandisers of reality. See, for people, for people raised as for people, for people who are tra formally trained or raised as graphic designers, we're talking about the sweet spot here. Media creation tools, media creation tools are critical, are critical, and have always been a critical component, a critical component of this fashioning of reality. So it only bears, it bears, uh, I don't know, it bears. Decentralized bears understanding that the decentralization and the democratization of these tools, the fact that they are, you know, that they are available to us so readily and so easily, um, uh, speaks to uh, speaks to the potential for the individual to leverage them, to use them to their own ends, to, for the artist, for the designer to use them to their own ends. A lot of this stuff is patently obvious, but it bears it bears repeating and thinking about in those terms. You know, the commercial artist, the graphic designer, the person who, uh, who studied communication arts, uh, communication design, the, the, the primary, the, literally the primary tools and the ideas that are part of that shared history and part of that, um, part of that skill set um, have been used and are used as, uh, as the way that we fashion reality. As the faith in old absolutes wanes, the season opens on the construction of new realities for those who do not care to be seen in the standard models. In earlier times, the invention of cultural forms was shrouded in mystery. This bears repeating. In earlier times, the invention of cultural forms was shrouded in mystery. Now it becomes, for better or worse, democratized. Individuals feel free to create new identities for themselves. And entrepreneurs of reality, entrepreneurs of reality, dabble gaily in the creation of new history, new science, new religion, new politics. The mass media make it easy to create and disseminate new structures of reality. A new reality does not have to convert the entire society. 
It merely has to find its buyers to get a share of the market and locate enough customers to fill up the theater. This theatricality is a natural and inevitable feature of our time. It is what happens when a lot of people begin to understand that reality is a social construction. The more enterprising among us, the more enterprising among us see that there is much to be gained by constructing and selling to the public a certain reality. And so reality making becomes a new art and business. Tom Stoppard's Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are Dead is one of the great myths of our time. It is not merely a play or even a play within a play, but a counterplay about people who don't want to follow the prevailing story. Some murky tragedy involving a Danish prince is taking place over there on one corner of the stage, but our heroes are not terribly interested in that plot. They do their own thing, spin out a different script, and so it goes in the postmodern world. If you don't like the plot, you can always try your hand at creating another one and seeing if anybody wants to take part in it. And entrepreneurs of reality dabble gaily in the creation of new history, new science, new religion, new politics. The issue that I was discussing with Lindsay is in some ways patently obvious in 2019. We need to look no, no further than Trisha Paytas. Hey everyone, I just wanted to make this video as a very public apology. Like I just, I'm a mess. I'm a mess. I'm a mess. Um, um. I just wanted to make this video. This is the last video you're gonna see of me like crying and being crazy, I swear. Um, I just need to apologize. Uh, Terrence Howard. You gotta walk away for a while or forever? For good, I'm, I'm, I mean, everyone keeps trying to tell me don't say it's forever, but I've spent 37 years pretending to be people so that people can pretend to watch and enjoy what I'm doing when I've made some discoveries in my own personal life with the science that you know, Pythagoras was searching for. I was able to open up the flower of life properly and find the real wave conjugations that we've been looking for for 10,000 years. Why would I continue, you know, walking on water for tips? Or Kim and Kanye. But for the artist, there seems to be, at least in my conversations, this reticence to, to, to understand that this, that this frame that we see here, that this literal frame is a window into which an audience, for lack of a better word, sees a non-objective reality. It's the same thing with these pieces that we see back here. The rectilinear bounds of the discrete artwork is a window into a fiction. And it does not, it does not, there is no necessary correlation to objectivist reality. And this is the point, even if you are an adherent, if you, even if you subscribe to a kind of transcendent Truth, even if you are, for lack of a better word, an objectivist, the artwork itself is a fiction. This thing that we're seeing right now is a highly scripted fiction. These pieces in the back are fiction. And I think it, be it, bears, it bears constant repeating that that fiction is within the artist's control. It's within the designer's control. And to see that as a fiction, to see this thing that I'm doing right now as a fiction, with no necessary correlation to an objective reality, that I don't need to tell the truth, that these pieces don't need to tell the truth. That the work, the work is a narrative. And in, in a lot of ways, not only is it a social construction, but it's a merchandising of a reality, a new history, a new religion, a new faith, a new politics, a new mathematics. Let's cut to Terrence Howard and see how thoroughly, for a moment, how thoroughly he has assimilated the idea of a new science, a new mathematics. Why would I continue, you know, walking on water for tips when I've got an entire generation to teach a whole new world? That, that's a big remark. Yeah. What, what, what do you intend to, to do? Well, let me put it this way. All energy in the universe is expressed in motion. All motion is expressed in waves. All waves are curved. So where does the straight lines come from to make the platonic solids? There are no straight lines. So when I took the flower of life and opened it properly, I found all new wave conjugations that expose the in-between spaces. That's... It's the thing that holds us all together.